Amelia could barely hold back her tears again. She believed again, for the umpteenth time, that everything would still be okay. But Olivia and her daughter Samantha, now they would once again make Amelia look like a stupid, spoiled girl who was having a hard time with adolescence. I knew, of course, that puberty was difficult. Olivia rolled her eyes at her upset husband. But this, Amelia was going downhill. If you only knew how hard it was for me to keep her in line. It wasn't like this with Samantha, though. I know you do a lot for Amelia, and I appreciate you for that. His father said, his eyes lowered to the floor. He was ashamed of his daughter, of her supposedly ugly behavior, and the most frustrating part was that it was useless to explain it to him. Amelia had tried many times to convey to her family that Olivia was constantly denigrating her. When her father is not at home, her stepmother humiliates her, floods her with endless errands, does not let her study, meet with friends, do her favorite things. But Olivia is a virtuoso at manipulating people, and a great actress, too. She always manages to turn father against daughter. She picks up such words that after them all the explanations and arguments Amelia seems to the man pathetic excuses and attempts to cast aspersions on the holy woman who pulls someone else's difficult child. So now Amelia will not even try to prove to her father that she is not guilty of anything. It wouldn't get her anywhere. The girl sat on her bed, huddled in the very corner and tucked her face into a huge teddy bear. Her grandmother's neighbor, Charles, had given it to her. Amelia was seven years old at the time. How thrilled she was when she saw her neighbor with the big toy in his hands. He came into their house as always with a big smile on his face. Ah, it was the most wonderful time. I wish I could go back there. Remembering her grandmother, Amelia smiled. Yes, the girl endlessly longed for a native person who loved her and completely accepted her. Grandmother surrounded her only granddaughter with warmth and care, talked to her a lot, often hugged her. But she has not been with Amelia for almost five years. Grandmother Nora was not when the girl was ten years old. And since then Amelia's life has changed a lot, and not for the better. But Amelia's childhood was just wonderful. Despite the fact that the girl did not know her own mother, she felt quite happy under her grandmother's wing. Amelia's mom died right after she gave birth to her daughter, her first and only long-awaited child. Some unforeseen complications from childbirth. There was nothing the doctors could do. That's how Stephen, Amelia's father, found himself with an infant in his arms. He loved his wife very much and for a long time could not come to himself after her loss. What to do with a newborn child Stephen had no idea. He was even afraid to take his daughter in his arms. It was good that his mother was by his side at this difficult moment. She took over the girl to the great relief of a confused son, completely absorbed in his own grief. At first, the grandmother lived in the city apartment of the orphan family. Amelia's mom had no parents for a long time. They died when she was still a student. Stephen worked as a shipwright on a fishing boat and often went on voyages, and he was not particularly eager to take care of the baby. So Amelia found herself in the full care of her grandmother. Grandmother at first tried to establish a connection between daughter and father. She wanted Stephen to take care of the baby himself. Not that the grandmother was difficult. No, just that it is right, so it is necessary. But the man wouldn't hear of it. He was in grief and blamed his daughter for what happened to his beloved wife. Amelia realized this later, when she was older. Father for a long time thought that it would be better if he and his wife generally lived without children traveled, paid all the attention to each other, and would be happy. Stephen was very much in love with his young, beautiful wife and experienced her loss long and hard. Eventually Grandma grew tired of being the link between Stephen and Amelia. She has long wanted to go to a small homeland, in a cozy house under a green roof in the region of Cheekshar. And she had a lot to do there. A vegetable garden, chickens, cats, and a dog. For all this farm, during the prolonged absence of grandmother, looked after the neighbor Charles. They certainly had a good and warm relationship. Grandma has helped him out many times too. But it was time to do the honors. Convinced that she could not get through to her adult son, 
The grandmother packed up little Amelia and went home with her. Stephen was only too happy to see this turn of events. The baby clearly annoyed him, and with its mere appearance reminded him of the tragedy. In addition, the man soon had to leave on a long voyage, which also pleased him. Waves, socializing with colleagues, hard physical labor. Stephen hoped that all this would help him to distract himself from the heavy thoughts. In part, by the way, it did. And the grandmother with her usual energy joined in caring for her little granddaughter. Diapers, diapering, walks with a stroller. It was as if she felt like a young mother again. Only now she was already enjoying motherhood with full commitment. When her own son Stephen was a baby, the woman did not realize what happiness it is a child. She had to deal with a whole bunch of things at once, to set up life in a small village house, to finish studying at the local college, and also to work part-time. Those were not easy times. Now, an old woman, all her time, all her attention, all her warmth was given to Amelia. Looking at the girl, she felt a mixture of pinched tenderness and acute pity. How could it be, such a little girl, and already without a mother? And the father, it seems, does not want to deal with his daughter. Her son's behavior was very upsetting to the caring grandmother, but she hoped she could fix it. Amelia grew up a sweet and trouble-free child. Little sick, all did in time, and sat up, and walked, and talked. Grandmother could not be pleased with her. The girl grew up surrounded by friendly people, from whom came only warmth and acceptance. First, of course, her grandmother. She was the most important person for Amelia. Reliable, caring, kind, always understanding, always supportive. She opened the world to her granddaughter, talked to her a lot about everything in the world, explained complicated things to the little girl. Amelia did not remember that at least once the grandmother waved away her questions, as it usually happens in adults. You do not understand yet. You will grow up. You will know. Go away. I do not care about you now. It was as if they understood each other without words. And grandmother also had friends and neighbors. And they were also involved in Amelia's upbringing. The girl went to visit them, made friends with their grandchildren. There were times when a bunch of children ran from house to house. Somewhere they would have breakfast together. Somewhere they would have lunch. Somewhere they would watch TV together. Someone's father would take the fair crowd to the river or to the woods. It was fun. The girl had a particularly warm relationship with Charles. His house stood opposite the grandmother's, and the elderly man often came to the neighbor to help her in the household with men's work, to fix the faucet, the roof on the shed to fix, the closet to move, and his grandmother fed him delicious pies and treated him to flavorful cutlets. Charles, on the other hand, he was a widower. Amelia heard this strange word for the first time and frowned thoughtfully, trying to figure out what it meant. Grandmother explained, of course. There was no one to bake pies for the neighbor. Of course, the man coped perfectly well with cooking, did not starve, but he never learned from the art of baking. Already later Amelia realized that, apparently, the neighbor felt for her grandmother not only friendly feelings. Why not? He's a widower. The neighbor's husband died a long time ago, too. But the grandmother, probably, she decided to devote her whole life to her granddaughter, without distractions for anything else. The old woman had big plans for Amelia's future. She was much engaged in the girl, put her whole soul into it, and thought that she would be with her granddaughter for a long time, and will teach her, and marry her, and with great-grandchildren even help. It didn't work out. Thanks to her grandmother, the girl has the fondest memories of her childhood. Amelia especially loved summer. Here is a really cheerful and carefree couple. To Charles came on vacation granddaughters from the city, Carrie and Linda. They were Amelia's best friends. She had been looking forward to them all year. The girls stayed together all day long. The three of them were never bored, but they liked to spend time with the other village kids. They raced on bicycles, went to the river and the forest, played hide-and-seek and catch-up, told scary stories in the evenings, played soccer barefoot. They crawled home tired and grimy, but happy. 
Often a flock of children slept over at Amelina's grandmother's house. She never refused her granddaughter if the girl asked to leave someone for the night. There was enough room in the house. The children chattered and giggled all night, but the grandmother did not admonish them. She realized how fun and exciting it was. Amelia, of course, realized early on that she didn't live like the other kids. Other kids had moms. They didn't all have fathers, but they had moms. There were all kinds of moms, young and grown up, beautiful and not so beautiful, strict and kind. They were always there for their children, and their dads too, of course. Amelia started asking her grandmother questions early on, so she had to tell the girl what had happened. Carefully, very carefully, the woman told the story of her birth. Amelia didn't know her mom. That's why she wasn't too upset. Especially the grandmother said that mom was now in heaven and was helping her daughter from there. It was like a beautiful fairy tale, but from time to time a longing for something beautiful and unfulfilled clutched the child's heart. Amelia sometimes imagined what it would be like to live this or that moment of life if mom was near. However, these thoughts did not particularly disturb the girl while she lived with her grandmother in Cheekshire. Amelia was their warm, cozy, good father. Of course, he sometimes appeared at her mother's, always came on Amelia's birthday with gifts, if he was not on a voyage. And at least once every two months he visited his own. For Amelia, it was familiar and dear, but practically a stranger. A handsome young man with sad gray eyes, always trim, always nicely dressed. He would show up with gifts, beautiful dolls, smart dresses, interesting books. Amelia wondered how her father always managed to guess so accurately what she was dreaming of. Is it really the thought of her reads? Then the girl realized that it was her grandmother telling her son what to buy for Amelia in the city. Her father usually came for a couple of days, less often for a week or two. About what to talk to his daughter he did not know. Asked duty questions about studies, friends, and hobbies. The girl saw that he was not particularly interested in all this, not like Charles. He loved to listen to Amelia's stories about the adventures of village children. He laughed, recalled some episodes from his childhood, unobtrusively gave important advice. The elderly neighbor was just a wonderful listener. Her father, on the other hand, he only asked because he had to. Amelia understood this, even as a very young girl. The girl really wanted to please her father, to interest him at least something, to please him in the end. But in vain, all of Amelia's attempts were broken by the indifference of this man. He diligently performed his fatherly and sonly duties, transferred money to her mother, bought the house necessary things when he came to visit, engaged in the garden and repair. But my father did it all out of a sense of duty. There was never any affection between him and his daughter. The grandmother tried to bring up her son, explained to him how to behave with the girl. Adults thought that Amelia was asleep, but she heard everything. A girl needs a father's attention. The mother explained to her son in a low voice. She's growing up, growing up. Come more often. Take her to visit or go on vacation together. Show her London, Liverpool. Take a vacation by the sea. You know, Mom, I work a lot. I'm always on voyages, making money. For Amelia's future, by the way. Ah, but you often forget about the present. Grandma sighed sadly. I don't forget, no, I can see that. I see how well you're doing. Amelia is happy with you. I, well, what can I give her? I'm still a little shaken up myself. Amelia, even though she was still very young, realized that she was burdening her father with her very existence. No, he would not take her on vacation or visit her more often. Father, he is better off on his own, without her and without grandmother, in some incomprehensible lonely life. It was a shame. Amelia loved her only parent very much. To realize that you do not need your father, it is scary and unpleasant. The girl even cried a little into her pillow, but she behaved as if nothing had happened in the morning. And then the father left, hugging his daughter, as always, in farewell. I'm going on a long voyage, he warned. I won't see you for a long time. 
On September 1, I will not be able to come to you. I'm sorry. It's all right. The girl waved her hand nonchalantly. She was not accustomed that her father was absent at the most important moment of her life. So what? But Grandma was always there for her. It was the summer before Amelia's first grade. The girl remembered it well, because in August she had a birthday party, where an important event took place. Grandmother, as always, had set two tables in the garden, one for the children and one for their parents and grandparents. She always made her granddaughter's birthdays so crowded, cheerful, colorful. The woman herself took great pleasure in socializing with good people. It was a celebration both Amelia and her grandmother looked forward to all year long. Charles showed up a little later than the other guests and presented Amelia with a huge teddy bear that his granddaughters, Carrie and Linda, had helped him pick out. Amelia marveled when she saw the teddy bear. She had never had such a huge toy before. Happy birthday, Carrie and Linda hugged the birthday girl. Thank you. Amelia clapped her hands. What's that thing Charles is holding? Oh, I found a guitar in the attic the other day. I was going through it. I thought I'd throw away the junk, and I came across this instrument. Charles, I had forgotten that you are a musician, said my grandmother. Since when have you not played? Probably, when your wife died, you never picked up a guitar. Yes, it's been fifteen years already, nodded the neighbor. A flicker of sadness flashed in his eyes for a moment. I had forgotten about the guitar, and he suddenly found it and remembered it. Play us something, asked one of the adult guests. Play, play, the kids chimed in. Carrie and Linda were beaming with pride beside their grandfather. Charles had suddenly become the star of the party. Look how everybody's looking at him. Look how everybody's begging him. Well, what would you like to play? Ditties, or what? Asked the man. Everyone murmured approvingly. Then Charles took the guitar more comfortably, struck the strings with his fingers, and some magic began. Melodic sounds filled the garden. Amelia stared at her neighbor with her mouth open in amazement. How does he do this? How does this beautiful melody come about? The guests fell silent, looking at Charles. What's the matter with you? Come on, sing. Who's first? Who's the bravest? The mother of Dick, a neighbor boy, one of Amelia's friends, began a ditty in a thick bass. She sang something about a calf that's like a calf. The adults laughed. Amelia didn't go into the meaning of the ditty. She listened to the melody. The guests were getting into a frenzy. They ordered Charles to sing more and more songs. And the man, strangely enough, knew them all. If he didn't know them, he could pick them out quickly. The grown-ups sang with an unstructured chorus. It was so wonderful, so funny, so beautiful. The kids came out from behind the table and started a game of hide-and-seek. Of course, they invited Amelia to join them. But she couldn't tear herself away. She sat next to Charles and listened. And then suddenly she began to sing along with the adults. She quickly learned the words of the song about the wounded soldier. It was probably the third time the guests sang it. Dick's mother was the first to notice it. Listen, she said suddenly. Do you hear her singing? The guests fell silent. Amelia, too. She was shy to sing alone. Dick's mother realized this and belted out the song with her. This made it easier for Amelia. And when the chords died down, there was applause. Well done. Amelia was praised by the adults. You sing well. Not just good. Dick's mom shook her head. The girl has talent. I'm telling you this as an employee of our house of culture. Nora, why did you hide such a treasure from us for so many years? I didn't know it myself, smiled the proud grandmother. Since then, Charles became an even more frequent guest in the house of his grandmother and granddaughter. And Amelia herself now constantly ran to him. The man taught the girl many children's cheerful songs. Now she constantly hummed them everywhere, at home, in the vegetable garden, even on the way to the store. Why didn't Amelia realize before how great it is to sing? She didn't go to kindergarten because it was too far to drive her. Her grandmother didn't work anyway, so her granddaughter grew up with her. At the kindergarten, of course, 
The music teacher would have noticed Amelia's talent sooner. But at home. At home, they had almost no music. Grandma usually played audiobooks, not songs. It wasn't until she was seven that Amelia realized that she incredibly enjoyed singing and music. When school starts, we'll send you to Dick's mother's house of culture. She says they have a good choir there. They even get invited to other cities to perform. You'll sing there. You can't bury such talent in the ground. Amelia listened to her grandmother and looked forward to September. She wanted to go on stage. She wanted to meet people who shared her passion. The future seemed bright and fabulous. And then the girl asked Charles to teach her to play the guitar. He refused at first. It's too young for you. Your fingers are small, your hands are weak. You can't even hold such a big thing. But the neighbor was wrong. Amelia got the chords right the first time. Linda and Carrie even clapped their hands in joy for their friend. See, Grandpa, she can do it. Are you going to teach her? Yes, of course I will. Charles scratched the back of his head in puzzlement. Where can I get away from you now? The neighbor kept his promise. Every day he taught little Amelia chords and everything he knew. The pupil was making great progress. Not only did she grasp everything on the fly, she also learned to pick out melodies. Of course, I don't know much about it. Charles shared his observations with Amelia's grandmother, but she seems to have an exceptional ear. She should go to music school. I wish she could, sighed grandmother. But we don't have one in checkers. There's only a choir here, and you can't go into town every day. Well, at least she'll be in the choir, Annie promised. Although her granddaughter's still young, there's older kids singing there. And then came the long-awaited September 1st. Amelia still remembered how her grandmother proudly led her through the village streets by the hand to the school line. The girl was a little nervous, but it was a joyful excitement. She and her grandmother carefully prepared for the festive day. The day before they went to the city, where they chose the most beautiful things for a long time. Lacquered shoes, a dressy white blouse, a lush dark skirt. In the morning, her grandmother braided Amelia's braids, which she decorated with large white bows. In her granddaughter's hands, she placed a beautiful bouquet of gladioli. Amelia still remembered the delightful fragrance they exuded. Passersby smiled at the grandmother and the dressed-up granddaughter, congratulated both of them on the beginning of their school journey, wishing the girl only A's. Amelia thanked people. She knew that in the evening there would be a holiday. Her grandmother had already invited the neighbor kids to visit and had started the dough for her special pies from the evening. Amelia was also waiting for the start of classes at the culture house. She wanted so much to sing on stage. Dick's mom assured her that Amelia would really like the teacher, and so she did. Pete appreciated the new student's abilities. True, he didn't give her a hard time either, despite her age. If the girl did not hit the notes or confuse the words, strictly reprimanded. But those were minor things. The main thing was that Amelia felt in her element. Grandmother worried that the modest granddaughter will be confused in front of the audience. But no, the little singer behaved on stage like a fish in water. At first Amelia was put as a singer, then she began to perform solo. Pete couldn't get enough of his pupil. Such a gift is rare, he told her grandmother when she came to pick up her granddaughter. A real uncut diamond. She should be in good hands. And what do we have? A simple village hall. Amelia never gave up her guitar lessons either. It had become a daily necessity for her. As a student, the girl had long surpassed her neighbor teacher, but still she went to visit Charles every day. First, he had a guitar. Secondly, the neighbor could always give valuable and important advice about playing. And thirdly, no one Amelia knew knew more about music than Charles. He praised on the case, noticed some subtleties, sincerely admired the success of the little neighbor. Already later, living with her father, Amelia recognized the expression, soulmate. Perhaps she and Charles were just these very soulmates. The neighbor replaced the grandfather Amelia had never known, and maybe even her father at some points. As time went on, Amelia grew up. She did well in school, performed with the choir, 
and continued to learn to play the guitar. Her father gave his daughter her own instrument for her next birthday. Of course, the idea of the gift was suggested to him by her grandmother. The girl had everything she needed to be happy, a caring grandmother nearby, understanding kind neighbors, loyal friends. Amelia felt loved and native. In Cheekshire, she was her own and did not even think about moving to her father in the city someday. What would there be to do there? Gray concrete boxes instead of houses, crowds of people rushing somewhere, who do not even look at each other, and her father, native, but completely unfamiliar and distant. People around her often said that there were more prospects in the city, that it would be much more interesting for the girl to grow up there. But Amelia felt quite happy and satisfied with life. Her childhood was warm, sunny, cozy. Until that fateful day in February, when Charles came to school to pick her up for some reason. Amelia had been going to school and coming home alone for a long time. At first her grandmother accompanied her, but since the second grade Amelia became quite independent in this respect. The road was not close, but in the company of friends' neighbors' time flew by unnoticed. The girls walked and chatted about everything in the world, laughed, discussed the details of the school day, made plans. And then suddenly there was a knock at the door during a literature lesson. A quiet conversation between the teacher and someone who hadn't crossed the threshold. And then Angel's worried eyes and her quiet request. Amelia, get ready. Your neighbor is here for you. Amelia felt the eyes of everyone in the class on her. That was how unusual this was. When Amelia saw Charles, she knew immediately. Something terrible had happened. A faded look, a gray complexion. The hands of the always calm man trembled slightly. Grandmother. Amelia knew at once. Her heart was squeezed by the icy hand of anxiety. In that instant, the girl realized that her grandmother was the whole world to her. The man nodded silently. What's the matter with her? She became ill. They took her to the hospital. Charles told the girl only at home that her grandmother was gone. The woman suddenly felt sick, heart palpitations. She sat down on a bench outside the house to wait it out. That's how she was caught by a neighbor who came to borrow a couple of eggs. Immediately called an ambulance, but the doctors who arrived could only state the fact of death. And so Amelia was left alone, all alone in the world. That night she was taken in by her neighbor, Marcho. She and her grandmother were close friends. In the company of a kind-hearted woman and her grandchildren, Amelia was not so dreary as if she was alone at home. But the girl was still in some incomprehensible state. Everything that was happening seemed unreal to her. This simply could not happen. What do you mean? Grandma's gone. And what? She'll never be there again. Never again. Dad was on a trip. He was informed, of course. But it took time to get to the mainland. The man didn't even make it to the funeral organized by his neighbors. During those terrible days, Amelia somehow did not think about her future. She cried a lot, often talking to the neighbors about her grandmother. Those knew and loved her, spoke good words about her. This made the girl feel a little better. And then her father arrived, clumsily hugged his daughter, and said the words that made Elena once again squeeze the garden of pain. Well, daughter, we will now then, we will live together in the city. How in the city? Why in the city? Amelia did not want to leave Cheekshire at all. Grandma's gone, of course, and she never will be. But there's school here, there's friends here, there's neighbors here. There's the choir, after all. Here is Charles, who will always support and comfort. There's Marshall, Dick and Dick's mom. And there's what? A cold, alien father who knows nothing at all about his daughter. He's, he's a stranger to Alina, for that matter. I'm not going with you, Amelia said firmly, pulling away from her parent. I'm not going to the city. The man stared at his daughter, eyes flapping confusedly. He didn't know what to say to her in response. The neighbors came to the rescue. Very carefully and gently they conveyed to Amelia the idea that there was no other way out. The neighbors hugged the girl, saying that they too would miss her very much. There were tears in the eyes of these people. 
Women and men, grandmothers and grandfathers, all gave her their phone numbers and assured her that they would always welcome her calls. Amelia was crying, too. It was hard for her to part with Cheshire, but the sensitive adults managed to convince the girl that she had to do it. There was no other way. You come to visit, Charles said, for the vacations, with Linda and Carrie will live at my place. What do I care? Two girls or three? You'll have more fun. Amelia knew it wasn't a polite invitation. Charles was really looking forward to her vacation, and that made her feel a little warmer and brighter. So Amelia went to town. It was not the first time the girl found herself in her father's apartment. She and her grandmother sometimes came to visit him. Amelia even had her own room here. A bed, a large clothes closet, a desk. Everything a child needs. But the girl never really liked this place. She liked her bedroom at her grandmother's house much better. It was full of cozy and important things. Plush toys, interesting books, an aquarium with colorful fish. But there was no escape. We'd have to get settled in. The first thing Amelia did was to put on the bed the very teddy bear Charles had given her the summer before first grade. It felt cozy at once. The toy reminded her of those happy and carefree times when her grandmother was around. Amelia's life had completely turned around. There was a lot to get used to. A new room, a new school, new faces around her. Unfamiliar terrain, different rules. A father constantly immersed in his own thoughts. He'd moved to a new position that didn't involve months of traveling. He had to be with his daughter all the time. And he was indeed a constant presence but only physically. Stephen's thoughts were clearly far away. Amelia could see that her father missed the sea, his colleagues, his friends, his old job, and he often complained to his acquaintances about the fact that now he gets much less money. I'm not used to living like this, counting pennies to a paycheck, said the man on the phone to one of his former colleagues. And here, on the big land, you can't earn as much as at sea. Stephen tried very hard to be a good father. In the mornings he made his daughter breakfast, and in the evenings he did not forget to ask Amelia about her day. The truth was that her parent listened to her half-heartedly. Amelia saw perfectly well that he was not interested in what she thought of the teacher and who of her classmates, what she said to her. Stephen bought the girl everything she needed. Clothes, food, school supplies, toys. He even enrolled her in music school. You used to play the guitar a lot back in Cheekshire didn't you? Why don't you play it anymore? Amelia sighed. Yes, indeed, since she hadn't given up her grandmother. She hadn't played anything, simply because she wasn't in the mood. So many things had piled up. There was some kind of constant chaos in her soul and head. By the end of the day, the girl was so tired of her own thoughts, impressions and emotions that she fell asleep as a hamstring. Did she want to play the guitar? But the words of her father made Amelia remember about her favorite instrument. The girl took the guitar, ran her fingers over the strings, and she immediately felt better, as if a warmth from the past had wafted to her, and why she had never guessed that music would calm her down so much. Do you want to go to music school? suggested her father. Amelia thought about it and agreed. From early years she heard from others that she should go there that in their small village such a talent in full measure cannot be revealed, that Amelia needs competent teachers from the city, and here it is, the very opportunity about which everyone kept saying. Father cost a lot of effort to achieve the enrollment of his daughter. Firstly, the school year was coming to an end. Secondly, the school teachers were not satisfied with the age of the student. The girl was ten and the music school accepted six to seven years old. But the father knew how to insist. And so, just a couple of days after their conversation, the girl began to attend a new educational institution. The school was large, bright. It was not at all like their village house of culture, the interiors of which had not changed since the Soviet era. Everything was different here. At first, Amelia was even afraid of the new teachers. They looked too strict and aloof. But when the study began, the girl realized that she had come to the right place. So much new knowledge, so many subtleties. 
Amelia absorbed musical literacy like a sponge, and of course, made great strides. Very soon, the teachers began to praise the diligent, talented student. It was very pleasant. The girl gradually settled in the city. She had new friends and girlfriends. True, such warm and almost kinship relations, as with Cheshire guys, no one has not formed with anyone, but it was not customary to be friends here as it was there. Still, it was great. Amelia and her classmates went to the movies and to the skating rink, to pizzerias and entertainment centers. Sometimes, they just walked around the park. Sometimes they gathered at someone's house. The birthdays of local children were not like in the village. They were not hearty gatherings of children and adults, but trips to a bowling alley or a trampoline center. Children were entertained by special people dressed in the costumes of cartoon characters, animators. Interesting, of course, in some places even fun. But every time Amelia remembered her own heartfelt and full of sincere hugs birthday parties. They were organized for her granddaughter by her loving grandmother. How Amelia missed and longed for her. This was not the first great loss in her life. But mom, the girl didn't know her, wasn't used to her, and therefore wasn't too worried about her absence. Grandmother was another matter altogether. With her father relations were polite, even, but some strained, clumsy even. He seemed to be trying to be an involved parent, but it didn't work. He wasn't interested in his daughter's thoughts and worries. He didn't understand her at all. Amelia didn't feel even a fraction of the love and warmth that her grandmother gave her. And it was very hard. The girl was literally freezing. It was good that she had music in her life. Amelia saved herself by taking the guitar in her hands and dissolving into melodic sounds. She played what the teachers assigned and also picked up songs that she liked or composed something of her own. With the help of sounds, the girl used to express her emotions, her longing for her grandmother and her former life, her anxiety, her desire to be closer to her only relative now, her father. Music relaxed, soothed, helped her feel more confident. Time passed. Being a small family was slowly getting better. Stephen was surprised to discover that his daughter was an excellent cook. It was unexpected. Children of his acquaintances of such age could not hold a knife in their hands and were considered almost babies. Amelia deftly wielded all the kitchen tools and in her young years baked mind-boggling pies and cooked flavorful borscht. When the girl first made them with her father a delicious dinner from the leftovers found in the refrigerator, the man was stunned. Returning from work, he even at the entrance to the entrance caught the aroma, from which he began to salivate profusely. But Stephen couldn't imagine that those odors were coming from his apartment. What are you? Was that you? Stephen marveled as he entered the apartment. Or did someone come to see us? It's me. Amelia smiled. She liked the look of amazement on her parents' face. My grandmother taught me. Grandmother had indeed taught her granddaughter the art of cooking since she was a little girl. As a little girl, Amelia had helped her knead dough. And becoming a little older, the girl learned to wield a knife. As a skilled hostess, she even liked cooking. It's almost like music, a real art. Now Amelia often cooked for their little family, and she did it with great pleasure. She liked to see how willingly her father devoured her culinary masterpieces. Somehow the relationship between the daughter and her father gradually improved. Yes, the adaptation was not easy and very long. It was a lot of work for both of them. But in the end, in the end, Amelia got what she wanted, the warmth and care of her favorite family man. It did not happen at once, not suddenly. Father's heart thawed gradually. The icy crust that bound it first cracked, and then it slowly fell away, crumbled. One day Stephen found it interesting to talk to his daughter. She had become quite mature and sensible, and her life was full of events and impressions. Now the father looked at his daughter in a completely different way. Amelia could feel it and was glad for the change. Her father no longer shut himself away when he came home from work. No, Stephen now shared his future plans and news from work with his daughter. Father and daughter went on several vacations, as grandma had once requested. Stephen showed Amelia the big cities of England, 
London, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham. The girl marveled and marveled, looking around, and Stephen genuinely enjoyed her reaction. They were such wonderful trips. Amelia found out that her father was a very intelligent and erudit man. He was knowledgeable in a wide variety of fields. Architecture, history, archaeology, culture, and he enjoyed sharing this knowledge with his daughter. In the first summer after the death of her grandmother, Amelia and her father came to Cheekshire. The man prepared the house for the long absence of the owners. He closed the windows with shutters, wrapped the furniture with polythene, threw out excess junk from the attic and from the basement. Stephen also found some real treasures, the plump photo albums that his grandmother had so carefully kept. Here was the whole family history, from grandma and grandpa's ancestors to Amelia. This archive my father took home to the city apartment. It took only a couple of days to prepare the house. During that time, Amelia felt as if she had traveled back in time. Familiar native places, smiling neighbors, old friends who missed her so much. When her father told the girl that it was time to go back, Amelia even had tears in her eyes. How can we go back? We've only been here for a short time. Well, I have to go to work. And I'm done with all my business. Why would we stay? The father hadn't gotten to know his daughter very well. He couldn't understand the girl's feelings. Charles, on the other hand, of course, knew right away. Let her stay with me for a couple of weeks, the old man said to Stephen. My granddaughters are here. The three of them have been friends since birth. And they miss each other. They will go for walks to the river and the woods, to breathe fresh air. It's a blessing, isn't it? Everything is better than girls all day long in a stuffy concrete box while you are at work. Stephen stretched out strangely uncertainly. You, Uncle Charles, you're kind of a nobody to her. What do you mean, nobody? The old man was indignant. She's like a third granddaughter to me. I've been nursing her ever since. These words of the elderly neighbor warmed Amelia's heart. She looked pleadingly at her father to spend at least a few weeks in her beloved Cheapshire in the company of her best friends. It would be a blessing, wouldn't it? Her father agreed. Amelia jumped for joy. And Carrie and Linda jumped with her. It was a wonderful time. It was the same as always. Playing late with friends, familiar places, neighbors who've known you since you were born. Except Grandma wasn't around. And her house looked out onto the road with its shutters boarded up. Sadness occasionally gripped the girl's heart. The people around her sensitively caught these changes in Amelia's mood and tried to support her. They made it easier for the girl. And then the father came to pick up his daughter, and it was over. Amelia cried as she left for the city. Her friends and girlfriends hugged her. Chartle stroked the girl's head. It's all right. It's all right. Don't cry. Don't get damp. You're not going away forever. Your father will bring you here to have a rest. You're welcome here. Amelia understood that the elderly neighbor says it is not for the sake of red words. She was always welcome in Cheshire. This simple truth made her feel better and warmer. But Amelia never came to Cheekshire for vacation again. Shortly after she left, Charles was hospitalized. A stroke. He pulled through then, but he could no longer live alone in the village. Charles was taken in by his daughter, Linda, and Carrie's mother. The family lived in another town. So, Amelia never saw her childhood friends or her kind neighbor again. Another stroke of fate. Another one. Anyway, the girl got used to the new reality. The relationship with her father became more cordial and warm. The household settled down. Life wasn't so bad. At least, Amelia always had a family member nearby, ready to support and listen. And the girl appreciated it. But her father, he'd been talking more and more about going back to sea. You see, this is my element. The waves, the wind, the sea air, and the vastness. Nothing for miles around. It's breathtaking. Amelia understood. She knew exactly what it was like when your heart began to pound with joy at the sight of your favorite scenery. And we don't have enough money, Stephen lamented. Those who go on voyages are paid many times more, but here, 
Here on land, the wages are different. Amelia didn't think they were in need. They had everything they needed, even more. They dressed beautifully, ate well, traveled. But her father still dreamed of more and often recalled his former earnings. Well, I'm an adult, Amelia said reasonably one day. I'm thirteen. I've been going to school on my own for a long time. And I've been cooking since I was a kid. Why don't you come back? I can see how much you miss the sea. I can manage on my own. No, you're just a child. You can't be left alone for so long. I don't know what could happen. What could happen? The girl sincerely puzzled. She felt herself independent enough to live a month, two months, alone. Yes, it will be boring without Daddy, of course, but she will manage. The law says you can't be left alone. You're only thirteen. The neighbors will find out. They'll call the guardianship office. Yeah, the neighbors are weird here, not like in Cheekshire. Amelia agreed. How would you feel about having a nanny? A nanny. Amelia snorted. What am I, some kind of baby? Well, if I'm going on a voyage, you'll need someone to look after you. It won't be a nanny for the kids, but rather a housekeeper, your au pair. I don't need an au pair. Amelia snorted. But she knew her father wouldn't leave her alone. It wasn't allowed. Fine, hire your own housekeeper, she said. The father made the decision to return to the sea, immediately perked up. Now he smiled and joked a lot. Stephen looked like a perfectly happy man. Amelia was happy to look at her parent, but she was also a little worried. What if she didn't get along with this woman who was supposed to look after her in the house? What if it turns out to be some nasty aunt? The search for a housekeeper was not going well. My father applied to many agencies and called the ads himself, but he only came across babysitters for the kids. These were pensioners or students, ready to pay to spend a few hours a day with a small child. But to live together with a teenager and look after the apartment no one agreed. However, the father did not lose hope of finding such a person. Who seeks, he will always find. Optimistically stated having failed again. One day Stephen returned from a friend's birthday party in high spirits. It was late in the evening. Amelia was sitting on a difficult math homework assignment when a happy parent came up to her and said that everything was settled. What's settled? The girl didn't understand. I found a nanny for you. Well, that is, a housekeeper. It's such an option. You couldn't think of a better one. Amelia tensed a little. It was her destiny we were talking about. Could you be more specific? Asked the girl. And the father told his daughter the story of this fateful, as it would later turn out, meeting. Stephen came to his friend's birthday party. Once they graduated from university together, then even worked on the same ship. Later, the paths of old friends diverge, but between them remained a warm buddy relationship. Simon had an anniversary. On this occasion, the man decided to roll a big celebration in a restaurant. Among the guests were many people whom Stephen had seen for the first time, including Olivia, an acquaintance of Simon's wife. The tall, slender woman looked beautiful, stylish, beautifully dressed, and friendly. At some point Olivia and Stephen got to talking. Both had already had a few drinks and were relaxed. The evening moved into the revelation phase. It was time for some fascinating and candid life stories. It turned out that Olivia had recently divorced her husband. Or rather, according to the woman, her husband simply put her and her daughter on the street because of a stupid quarrel. How could this man do this to his child? Indignant Stephen. I have a daughter myself, and I, Samantha is not his daughter, Olivia sighed. She's my child from my first marriage. My husband, now ex-husband, could never accept another man's daughter. He never loved her. Olivia was in a desperate situation. There was no money to rent a place to live. The woman could not find a good job, as she had no education and no experience. Olivia devoted herself to her husband and daughter. She looked after the house, cooked her husband delicious meals, organized the household. And he, a successful businessman, provided the family with money. Olivia felt quite happy and protected, but without realizing it, 
She was in a very vulnerable position because she was completely financially dependent on her husband. And now I'm all alone in this predicament. I grab for any part-time work to feed myself and the light. My parents are long gone. There is nowhere to wait for help. A friend invited me to a holiday, said that I need a little distraction from everything. But I still think about my problems all the time. Yes, and I still thought that I had a hopeless situation. Stephen stretched out. It's much harder for you, of course. I hope everything will work out in the end. I'll try to help you with work. There's a secretary needed in the shipping industry. What's going on with you? Olivia missed the potential job offer and latched onto the words desperate situation. And Stephen told this sensitive, beautiful woman everything. About the death of his beloved wife during childbirth, about his daughter, about the mother who raised the girl until ten years old, about the difficulties of adapting to his own child, when suddenly Amelia was left without the care of a loving grandmother, and about her dream of the sea, of course. Looking for someone like a nanny for my daughter, but no one agrees. People offer hourly babysitting services for babies, but no one wants to live with a teenager and keep an eye on the house. Olivia's eyes lit up at this admission from the man. Really? Don't you realize that our meeting today was no accident? The woman exclaimed. It's, it's just a miracle. The very conduct brought us together. Much later it would turn out that it wasn't the event that had brought Stephen and Olivia together. Jubilee's wife was aware of the situation of her husband's friend, and she really wanted to help her friend in distress. The women purposely arranged for Olivia and Stephen to meet at the party. Both thought it was a wonderful outlet for both the woman and the single man. How old is your child? Olivia asked. Thirteen. And my daughter, Samantha, is fifteen. I know how to raise teenage girls. I know how to approach them. I like to talk to them. We're gonna get along. Stephen was thinking. He needed a housekeeper, that was true. But he'd expected a professional woman from a specialized agency. And here was Olivia with her daughter. But on the other hand, time was running out. You're about to go on a trip. And the problem's not solved. Your little girl's about to enter puberty. It's a very dangerous period. I know, Samantha and I have been through it. At that age, children need special supervision, or they can get into trouble. Olivia sounded convincing and confident. Stephen thought about it. Indeed, this woman had a lot of experience with children. She had a daughter a little older than Amelia. The girls would have fun together, and they would find a common language. And Olivia was a real beauty. Stephen liked to be in her company. She had a good disposition. After thinking about it, the man agreed. I think it's a great option. He smiled at Olivia, who he liked more and more. She was a strong woman, a woman who had withstood many blows of fate without breaking down. She radiated goodwill. Pleasant, intelligent, sensitive. Yes, exactly the kind of person Stephen would have wanted to be around Amelia. Olivia and her daughter Samantha moved into Stephen and Amelia's apartment. The man put them in the living room. There was plenty of room. Both Olivia and Samantha seemed like nice and kind individuals to Amelia at first. Wow, your hair looks great. Samantha marveled when she saw the girl. Can I try to braid it for you? Amelia shrugged. She'd never been very good with her hair. She did a neat ponytail before school. And that was it. But Samantha had created a stylish braid hairstyle on Alina's head, which was incredibly stylish. Amelia admired her reflection in the mirror. You're beautiful. Samantha smiled. You, you too, Amelia whispered. And it was the truth. Both Samantha and her mother were real beauties. Tall, slender, big-eyed. They always attracted attention, and men always looked at them. And both Samantha and Olivia knew how to accentuate their looks. They chose the right outfits, skillfully applied makeup, made beautiful and very stylish hairstyles. Eliona at first perceived it all as magic. In her and her father's house, there was never any makeup or battered clothes from the closets. The girl mesmerized followed Inga's movements, once applied makeup in front of the mirror. Interesting, isn't it? Smiled the woman. 
noticing once the girl's gaze. Come, sit next to me, I'll show you how to do it. And in half an hour Olivia made Amelia into a completely different person. In the mirror the girl saw not herself, but a beautiful girl with mermaid eyes, a delicate blush on her cheeks and plump doll lips. You're gorgeous, Olivia marveled. Always walk like that. But Amelia couldn't always walk like that. Yes, it was beautiful, of course, but she didn't like the feeling of makeup on her face, and it was a shame about the time. First you put on the makeup, then you wash it off. It could take an hour. Olivia and Samantha were giving Amelia something she was sorely lacking. Female attention. They shopped and picked out outfits together, gossiped, discussed movies and stars. Samantha always braided Amelia's hair before school. She did wonderful hairstyles. Stylish, beautiful, comfortable. Olivia and Samantha also helped her with her closet. Your clothes are kind of baggy, gray, Olivia said, inspecting the girl's closet. They don't let me wear anything else at school, Amelia said. Somehow she hadn't thought about it before. Nonsense. You could always find something that would fit the regulations and fit nicely. Samantha, I think we should go shopping. Are you coming? You have amazing taste. We're gonna need your advice. Of course you are. I love shopping. Olivia and Samantha really picked out Amelia's clothes that made her look like a princess. Tight lace blouses, slightly shorter skirts, high heels. Well, that's different, Olivia said, looking around at her ward. You have a great figure. You're slender, long-legged. Why hide it all under shapeless hoodies? You should be wearing a potato sack. Amelia had never received so many compliments at school. For the first time in her life, she didn't feel like a smart girl, but a real beauty. And it was wonderful. Samantha became for Alina a real older friend, almost the sister the girl had always dreamed of. She was older. Samantha would tell the girl about her relationships with boyfriends and girlfriends. It was so exciting that Amelia even forgot to breathe. It was like a soap opera, only it was real. Samantha was a great storyteller. Her speech flowed smoothly and measuredly, and pictures from the life of this beautiful girl rose before Alina's eyes. Amelia admired Svetlana. Are you two gossiping again? Olivia looked into their room. Let's go watch our movie, The Pizza Is Here. Those were wonderful days. Amelia felt part of the exquisite female world. Her father, the girl adored him, but he couldn't give her all that girlishness. It turned out that Amelia needed that companionship. She hadn't even realized it before. When Olivia found out that Amelia could cook well, she was thrilled. Wow! The woman marveled when she saw the girl taking a tray of pies out of the oven. Is this, is this you yourself? Yes. Not without pride, Amelia answered. My grandmother taught me. I've been doing this for a long time. Amelia was bored with the food ordered from the restaurant and decided to treat Olivia and Samantha to some homemade pastries. This is divine, Samantha praised, taking a big bite out of the pie. I've never tasted anything like it, but it's bad for your figure. At your age it's fine, Olivia smiled. But Amelia, you surprise me. You wouldn't believe it, I still haven't learned to bake. And you're so young, and you're already so good. Amelia blossomed with these compliments. Now, to please Olivia and Samantha, she tried to cook something every day. She was really much better at it than Olivia. The woman's soups were often too liquid and too salty, and casseroles constantly burned on top and did not bake inside. That was why Olivia preferred to order takeout. Amelia had no trouble making dinner or lunch for the three of them. The girl did it gladly. Samantha and Olivia, they took such good care of her, and we taught her so much. And then her father came back. Olivia and Samantha moved back into their rented apartment. And Amelia, she was very upset by that fact. Amelia missed the girls' heart-to-heart -heart talks, going to cafes and stores. She missed Olivia and Samantha, who showed her a different side of life, one that Amelia didn't even know she had. Amelia described Olivia and Samantha in the most vivid colors. They're so great, you can't imagine, she said to her parent. 
They are so interesting, so good. Her father smiled. The girl saw that he was satisfied with her stories. A month passed, and Stephen was again sent on a voyage, this time for even longer than the first time. Again, Olivia and her daughter came to look after Amelia. Time flew by, and when her father returned, Olivia and Samantha hadn't gone anywhere. They stayed in the apartment, which Amelia was incredibly happy about. The girl noticed, of course, that her father looked at Inga in a special way, and the woman herself, though she tried to hide it, clearly sympathized with her employer. But Amelia thought that it all seemed to her that she was just wishful thinking. Turns out she wasn't. Samantha looked at Amelia like a little child as she shared her impressions with her. I had no doubt it would be. I just got the timing a little wrong. Yeah, well, Samantha's like that. Attentive, experienced. She's got a diamond in the rough. Dad went back on the road, and then he and Olivia got married. They didn't have a big wedding, just four of them at a restaurant. Amelia was over the moon. This beautiful, kind woman had joined their family. She would now live with them, giving Amelia the female attention she needed. That's great. Amelia had dreamed of something like this for a long time. But it had turned out much better than she could have imagined. Not only did she have Olivia, but Samantha, practically an older sister, a friend who knows so many interesting things, everything changed as soon as her father left on his voyage. The stamp in her passport had radically transformed Olivia's relationship with her stepdaughter. Amelia expected from her stepmother and stepsister the same behavior, care, heart-to-heart -heart talks, joint walks, but all that had stopped abruptly. Olivia went to her friends and beauty salons. Samantha also lived her own life. Friends, admirers, nightclubs. And Amelia, she was all alone. Alone again. She had stopped being paid attention to abruptly. The only thing she was praised for was cooking and cleaning. Amelia single-handedly cleaned the entire apartment and cooked mind-blowing lunches and dinners just to earn Olivia's approval. She didn't realize what was going on. Her stepmother praised her discreetly and ordered new dishes for the next day. Sometimes Olivia also asked Amelia to mop the floors. That was all the communication. Amelia felt confused and deceived. Samantha, tell me about your time at the club. One day the girl asked Samantha a question. She looked absent-mindedly at Amelia and said nothing. When the girl repeated her question, Samantha sighed heavily and grumbled. You're so clingy, you're a sticky little thing. You're impossible to be around. It was a blow to Amelia. She had thought she and Samantha were friends. The girl used to share the details of her life with her. They talked a lot, went for walks together. Samantha had given Amelia invaluable advice on makeup and clothing combinations. And now this. More on that in a moment. Olivia had gotten the hang of it. Amelia was now in charge of the entire household. The stepmother did very little cooking in her husband's absence. That was the stepdaughter's responsibility. Cleaning was the same. If earlier the girl was at least praised for her help around the house, now she received only remarks and reproaches if she did not have time to do something. And it was hard. Amelia still had school and music school. Of course, the girl's grades got worse. It's impossible to do everything at home and study well at the same time. Amelia tried to explain to Olivia that she couldn't cope. I'm tired. I can't do my homework. I'm missing music class for the last time. At least let Samantha cook and clean once in a while. That, my dear, is called laziness. Olivia looked at her stepdaughter with an indifferent gaze. Nothing supernatural is required of you. Didn't you know that people who live together share household chores equally? Equal? That was too much of a stretch. There was no such thing as sharing. Samantha lived her life to her heart's content, going out with friends, going on dates, shopping, and going to beauty parlors. Sometimes underage Samantha didn't even come home for the night. Olivia called her, occasionally even drove somewhere at night to pick up her wayward daughter. Only her father. He knew nothing about this side of Samantha's life. In his presence, the girl behaved impeccably. Samantha did nothing, absolutely nothing around the house. 
Even Amelia had to make her bed for her. Samantha is preparing for her final exams, Olivia said in response to Amelia's fair remarks. At first she tried to defend herself. You have two years to go to school, and she's about to. But Amelia had never seen Samantha with a textbook in her hands. The girl attended school reluctantly. She had big problems with her studies. All she had on her mind was dating and partying. And she only cared about her own appearance. Samantha did not get out of beauticians and beauty salons. This, of course, gave its fruits. Well-groomed, spectacular, stylish. Olivia spent the lion's share of the money her father left for the household on herself and her daughter. Amelia got the rest of the money. Olivia worked in the kitchen and around the house only when her father was home, creating the image of an ideal housewife. The woman didn't work. She explained to her husband that the girls needed special care now. A difficult age and all that, an eye and an eye for teenagers in this period. Stephen agreed with Olivia's reasoning. She had a knack for convincing others that her decisions were reasonable and beneficial to everyone. It was her talent. Stephen even sincerely believed that he himself had suggested to his wife to take care of the house and children, and appreciated this, as he thought, sacrifice Olivia, to put her career on the altar of happiness and well-being of the family. It's practically a feat. Olivia had a great influence on her father. He looked at her with admiring eyes, believed every word of her spouse, considered her perfect and infallible. Amelia used to like this, and she was glad for her own man. So many years alone, and now, finally, found his love. But now, now the girl was hurt and even scared. Olivia gradually turned from a kind and sensitive woman into a monster. The stepmother made higher and higher demands on Amelia. Every day the girl was rebuked. And she cooks wrong, and cleans too slowly, and pays too much attention to nonsense. Why are you strumming on that bander of yours? Olivia pointed her manicured finger contemptuously at the guitar. I'm getting a headache from your tedious songs. Amelia was silent. She knew that if she opened her mouth and tried to defend herself, she'd be bombarded with a torrent of insults. She was past that. It was better to keep silent so her stepmother would calm down. Olivia didn't like Amelia's passion for music. She repeatedly called the girl talentless, constantly asked her to play quietly, as if it were possible, forced her stepdaughter to skip lessons at the music school. Except that music, it was a real salvation for the girl. Playing it soothed her, relaxed, gave joy. And joy was already too little in Amelia's life. When Olivia was with her father, of course, she behaved very differently. Amelia couldn't get used to the metamorphosis. A sensitive, anxious parent, a wonderful hostess, a loving wife. Her father often said how lucky he was to have met such a woman. Olivia was slowly turning the man against his daughter, carefully, delicately, masterfully. The woman was in disguise. She appeared to Stephen as a worried parent. Amelia's going through puberty, puberty. She's become like this, snapping, lazy, hates everyone around her. She's dropped out of school. She's not interested. She only thinks about going out just to get out of the house, Olivia said to her father, not caring that Amelia didn't hear her conversation. The woman didn't care. The man wouldn't believe his daughter's words if she tried to justify herself. Olivia's influence was too strong. The woman was too skillful at manipulating those around her. What should we do? Stephen looked at his wife in puzzlement. He was waiting for advice, help, support. Of course, the man loved his daughter and did not want her to fall into the abyss. Yes, Olivia used such vivid imagery to convince him. I think she should leave music school, her stepmother suggested one day. Amelia spends too much time on nonsense, and her studies are suffering. I generally think that under the label of music school she is walking around in bad company. I'd spoken to the music teacher, and there's a lot of truancy. Dad agreed with Olivia as usual. Her words were always decisive. When the man announced to his daughter that she would no longer study music, Amelia immediately realized whose work it was. It was the first time the girl had openly objected. 
She was defending her life's work, and therefore suddenly became bold and decisive. No, I don't want to quit music school. Olivia, she just wants me to spend more time at home and do all the housework. I cook, I clean, I do laundry. I'm like a servant while you're away. See, Olivia looked at her husband, looking upset and worried. See how she reacts. And all I'm doing is teaching the child to work. It's no big deal. In all normal families, children have little chores. But all Amelia wants is to go out and be free. It's dangerous at that age. Look at your daughter. Amelia couldn't stand it. Watch her. The girl couldn't take it. She snapped. This played into Olivia's hands. She pretended to be an understanding woman who didn't take offense at the irascible teenager, but only cared about him, wishing him well. Amelia had tried to complain to her father about Inga before, but he hadn't taken her words seriously. His new wife is so perfect. You're just jealous. Stephen stroked his daughter's head. I'll try to pay more attention to you. No matter what Amelia said, it sounded unconvincing, because Olivia, a skilled manipulator, was always working her father. And after this open quarrel, Amelia's words had ceased to matter to Stephen. At least the girl thought so. By the way, Amelia still had to leave the music school. Her father insisted. The girl lost her only outlet. She did, of course, occasionally play for herself. It somehow relieved the stress, in which Amelia was now constantly, every once in a while. Olivia pitted father and daughter against each other to reinforce the effect. She played people like chess pieces. The father was at the mercy of his bewitching wife. He was fully convinced that puberty had made a monster out of his lovely daughter and thanked fate that during this difficult period next to the girl is an experienced and attentive woman. At first Amelia still tried to get through to her parent, but every time after that Olivia arranged something new. Once Samantha had taken money from the family stash, Amelia knew it. She had heard Samantha begging her mother for money for a trip to Liverpool with friends. She refused her daughter, explaining that she did not like the girl's company. But Samantha was not used to restrictions. She still went to Liverpool, which made Olivia furious. She reprimanded her daughter on the phone, threatened her, ordered her to return urgently. Of course, Samantha had no intention of obeying. She wasn't that kind of person. Of course, both Olivia and Amelia understood where the girl had gotten the money. Stephen's stash. But when her father returned, her stepmother blamed it all on Alina. Samantha was already home at the time and pretended to be a model high school student. Acting abilities she went to her mother and even perhaps surpassed her. The father did not scold his daughter then, no. He talked to her for a long time trying to find out why the girl needed such a sum of money. Maybe you're in trouble. Maybe you need help. Amelia tried to explain to her parent how things really were. He shrank back even more, as if in great pain, and begged her not to deceive him. Tell the truth, the father pleaded, taking his daughter's hands. What is happening to you? Amelia said nothing more. It was useless. Her father thinks she is a troubled teenager capable of stealing. What can I say? Olivia's words have proven to be a powerful tool. A man doesn't trust his daughter, but he takes his wife's every word at face value, and there was nothing the girl could do about it. The time had come. The moment of Samantha's admission to the university was approaching. Amelia realized that the girl would fail miserably. I wonder how her stepmother would explain it to her father. She had been working hard on her daughter's image all these years, Samantha appeared in her stories as a smart, diligent student, a gifted girl. Olivia was always comparing the girls, and Samantha always outperformed Amelia in everything. But that's all right. Olivia urged her husband. If I raised one girl so successful, I can do the same with your daughter. I know how to raise girls. At a certain age, they need a firm hand. Her father agreed with Olivia and gave her the authority to raise Amelia with a light heart. You know best, he told her. Amelia, she had somehow even gotten used to this life. Reproaches, ridicule, indifference, shifting most of the household chores onto the teenager's shoulder, restricting her in everything. 
Amelia sometimes felt like Cinderella. Olivia was the textbook stepmother. It's true what they say. A tale is a lie, but a tale is a hint. And then, then, in the absence of her father, William began to visit Inge, a young man, stylishly dressed, always smiling and polite. The woman explained to the girls that he was her distant relative. But William looked at Olivia with such eyes that Amelia realized her stepmother was lying. Samantha also did not believe her mother. She smiled achidically every time this guest appeared in the house. Now Olivia could afford not to come home at night, and Amelia knew exactly what was going on. She wasn't a little girl anymore. The stepmother had a lover. This William. Young, handsome, charming, head over heels in love. The girl felt bad for her father. He trusts his wife so much, and she. And the girl also tried to understand why Inge needed this man. After all, stepmother did nothing for nothing. If she brought a man closer to her, it was only to get something from him. William didn't come into Olivia's life by accident. Maybe it's just a matter of feelings, though. He's a handsome man, reminiscent of the model boys in the magazines. Even Samantha was giving him special looks. Amelia tried to tell her father what was going on. Carefully, she told him about the man who sometimes came to the house and Olivia's absences. Her father frowned. Are you telling the truth? You're not trying to smear Olivia again. You two are always fighting. Dad, it's the truth. The girl almost shouted. She could sense that her father didn't fully believe her, but she had planted a seed of doubt in his soul. Of course, Stephen talked to his wife. She told him something about a relative visiting from out of town. And then she started complaining again about Amelia, who was lying and arguing with everyone just to protest. Amelia heard every word her stepmother said. The girl clenched her fists in impotent anger. Olivia looked and sounded as convincing as ever, not like herself, a resentful, grown-up girl with problematic behavior. Stephen didn't know what to do. Leave his dream job again and go back to the big earth. But it would be even harder to do that now. After all, he was supporting not only himself and his daughter, but also two people. He's taken responsibility, so he must provide for his family. Amelia is completely out of hand. Perhaps she needs her father around, but how to leave the ship? Making pennies isn't an option anymore. Olivia. Enchanting, delightful, intelligent, subtle. Stephen was head over heels for this woman at first sight, just in time to meet her at a mutual friend's anniversary party. And then it turned out that Olivia and Stephen could help each other, as if the puzzle had come together. At first, Amelia was thrilled with her stepmother and stepsister. Her daughter's eyes lit up with a happy fire. She was so happy that Olivia and Samantha had moved in with them. Then, going out on a voyage, Stephen had peace of mind, his daughter in good hands. Coming home was much more pleasant, too. What happiness it is when you are waiting impatiently for your favorite woman, and even so beautiful. Stephen had forgotten it could be like that. The man invite himself. And then came Amelia's notorious age of transition. The child had been replaced. The girl was now lazy and snappy, lying and skipping classes, trying to quarrel with her stepmother and father. She made up stories about Olivia and Samantha, reacted inadequately to ordinary requests, and once even took a decent sum from the family piggy bank. I wondered what she needed that kind of money for. Stephen was afraid that his daughter had gotten involved with bad company, especially since Olivia thought so too. Amelia was always complaining about her stepmother. No wonder. She'd raised her stepdaughter, restricted her freedom, and horror of horrors made her clean up after herself. It's much nicer to be lazy all day, not to bother with lessons and household chores, to live a life of pleasure. Of course, Olivia was in the girl's way now. That's why she was freaking out. Stephen understood that, but he didn't know how to help his daughter get through this difficult age with the least possible loss. He never did. It's a pity they don't give you an instruction manual with your baby. And now, now Amelia had overstepped her bounds. She insinuated that Olivia had a lover, a William. 
The wife did not deny it. Indeed, her relative, who had recently moved to their town, was visiting them. The busy young man who never took the time to get to know Stephen, working hard, trying to make his way in this life. But Amelia, she assures him that Olivia is a lying monster and that William is her lover. Stephen looks into his daughter's honest eyes and is horrified. Had Amelia really become a slanderer and a liar? This was so unlike her. That's when the man decided to install a hidden surveillance camera in the apartment. He's going to record it. The clips will be streamed online to his phone. On his next visit, he'll provide Amelia with proof. She'll see the footage, realize how stupid and ugly her attempts to smear Olivia look. Maybe something will click in her head, and the girl will come to her senses. There's nothing sobering as looking at yourself from the outside. Stephen hadn't expected to see this. At first he was still feeling guilty, peeking at the homies as if he didn't trust them. He's good, I'll give him that. But the tapes, the footage the camera was broadcasting, turned his whole mind upside down. Olivia was really treating Amelia like a servant. She looked at her with contempt, forced the girl to slave for the whole family. And those were impossible chores for a teenager. Amelia didn't just clean up after herself and run errands. She kept the whole house clean, scrubbed the plumbing, cooked lunches and dinners, and received only reproaches and insults for it. No, when Stephen was home, Olivia didn't act like that. The man couldn't believe his eyes. His heart ached when he saw Amelia as a disenfranchised Cinderella. Was Olivia really lying? Lying to him all the time, with those honest, loyal eyes. And Amelia... How many times had she tried to get through to her father, and he didn't believe a word her daughter said? What a terrible thing, poor girl. If he could, the man would have traveled hundreds of miles to protect his daughter. With his own hands, he made his own child's life a nightmare. And the girl had come to him for help, but Stephen didn't believe her. The daughter's words looked like pathetic excuses. Amelia's stories about William were also confirmed. Indeed, the young man sometimes came to their house, and he hugged Olivia in a very unrelated way. Sparks were flying between Olivia and William. The camera was good. Stephen could hear every word the couple said. William turned out to be an experienced and very expensive lawyer. Olivia couldn't afford him. So she went about it the usual way, using her strongest charms. Yes, Olivia and William were lovers. The young lawyer must have been influenced by the woman's natural magnetism, and the woman, of course, had her own agenda. Very soon Stephen realized which one, a plot of land in Cheekshire. Stephen's mother had left the house and garden as an inheritance to her granddaughter. Olivia knew this and was looking for a way to sell the property. She needed the money. Samantha, the woman's own daughter, would not enter the university on a budget. The girl had never bothered to study, and miracles, as we know, do not happen. Therefore, Olivia needed a decent amount of money, which would be enough to pay tuition for Samantha. The woman knew very well that Stephen, no matter how much he was in love with her, would never agree to such a thing. That's why she needed William. As Amelia's guardian, Olivia had the right to dispose of her stepdaughter's property until she came of age. The woman was going to pull a scheme, sell the house in Cheekshire, and use the proceeds to pay Samantha's tuition. But Stephen was not to find out about it. William, as an experienced lawyer, was helping his mistress with the case. Olivia knew how to manipulate people like no one else. Realizing what was happening, Stephen clenched his fists in impotent anger. Amelia couldn't be left alone with these horrible people. There is still a lot of time until the end of the flight. Interrupting a business trip is difficult, but Stephen will do it. Amelia is in danger. Amelia struggled to hold back tears, not enough for Samantha to see how hard it was for her. She and her mother are deliberately driving her to breakdowns. The girl had made ugly scenes in front of her father more than once because she couldn't hold it all in. This played into the hands of the stepmother. Now Olivia accused Elena of vagrancy. The stepmother was diligently creating an image in her father's eyes of a daughter 
who was a troublemaker, a cad, a slacker, and now here was the gullet. Amelia was just spending the night at a friend's house. She warned Olivia about it on the phone. Do whatever you want, the stepmother said indifferently. I don't care. Of course she didn't care. Amelia had cleaned the apartment the day before and cooked for a couple days. Otherwise her stepmother wouldn't have let her out of the house. Returning home in the morning, Amelia found the police in the apartment. At first the girl thought it was Samantha. She often disappeared at night. Olivia periodically traveled to get her daughter out of trouble. Did you find her? The policeman asked Olivia. She nodded her head. And then the girl realized what was going on. Her stepmother had reported her underage stepdaughter to the police for not coming home for the night, even though she knew exactly where she was. I warned you that I would stay at my friend's house, Amelia said in amazement, looking at her stepmother. The girl had already guessed that the woman had thought of a new way to make her stepdaughter look like a troubled teenager, this time involving the police. You're cheating again, the woman sobbed. What am I going to do with you? One more trick like that, and we'll put her on the register, warned the representative of the authorities, leaving the apartment. Put her on the register. Maybe that's what the stepmother wanted. And now Amelia was trying not to cry, curled up on her bed. The girl hugged the bear Charles had once given her and realized that she would be made to look like a lost girl in front of her father again. And he, he, as always unconditionally believe his wife, will look at his daughter with sad, anxious eyes. That look of pain and disappointment. And it's hard to bear. Suddenly, a key turned in the door. Amelia was startled. Who could it be? Samantha and Olivia are home. Father would be at sea for another three weeks. Had Olivia really given the key to this William of hers? That's all I needed. But Dad's voice came from the hallway. I'm home. You're back. So soon. Olivia's voice sounded bewildered and lusciously happy at the same time. What a blessing. I know everything. Her father clearly didn't share his wife's enthusiasm. I've seen and heard everything. Pack your things. You have until tonight. You will do nothing more to my daughter. Nothing. Amelia's heart raced like a caged bird. She rushed into the hallway and hung around her father's neck. How did he know about everything? That was something Amelia would find out later. But right now, it didn't even matter. Stephen held his daughter in a tight embrace, smelling of the sea. Everything's going to be all right now, the man murmured. I'm sorry for not believing you. I won't let anyone hurt you again. 